You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Cantoni. It's been a long time. I am a seminarian, uh, to remind you all. And with the uh, pandemic and everything upside down through that, and finals week, and a very, very busy Holy Week and Easter season as a seminary. This is all new to me, but thanks be to God, He is so good. He got us through it all, and uh, incredible. It was an incredible season. I have to, I have to uh, admit, an incredible school year, and it was a very, very awesome um, semester for me as a seminary. And I thank you all for your prayers. I'm glad to be back. I couldn't wait to do a show, but uh, it was it was not easy <laughs> this time. So, but nevertheless, here we are again, and I'm so looking forward to sharing that great love for Mary, our beautiful Queen Mother, and I have some very very good information given to us by Saint John Paul II, who, if you want to know a saint who really loved the Mother of God, look to Saint John Paul II. My goodness. And, uh, you know, even as a little boy, St. John Paul, uh, Carol Wartia at the time, at, at the age of nine, he lost his mother. And she died at the age of nine. And his father was a very saintly man. He brought young Carol into a church, and he brought him right to a statue of our beautiful Queen Mother Mary. I think it was Our Lady of Chesnohova, the great... Um, image in Poland, and he stood her before, he stood Saint, uh, uh, young Carol before the statue, and he said, here is your mother now. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And that little boy, that young Carol, he took it to heart, and oh my goodness, did he write some incredible stuff on the great mother of God. This, I think you're going to really, really enjoy. I've got a couple of apostolic letters from him I'd like to read to you. I can't speak it more eloquently than him, so I, I'm going to probably read it as he has written it, and uh, perhaps uh, if the Holy Spirit leads me and guides me, I'm going to I will, uh, comment on that. And uh, in fact, uh, just by reading what he read for myself, it sparked and opened up all kinds of, um, especially with St. Joseph, it opened up the, the mysteries that you don't see written in Scripture. So the Holy Spirit really is speaking and working through what St. John Paul II wrote on his great uh, love for Mary. And there's so much more. I mean, he wrote on the mercy of God. I'd love to do a show on that maybe in the near future because I know our Lord wants to get his message of mercy out there. It is so important. God is a merciful God. He comes to condemn no one. He wants us to not be afraid, not run away, not believe the devil's lies that God is the enemy of our freedom, and he's a tyrant, he's the cause of our suffering. He is not. The devil is, and he's twisting it and pointing the finger as if it was God's fault. Liar. He is a liar. God is incredibly merciful, infinitely merciful. He's a tender, loving father. He wants to embrace his children with all the love in his heart if you would only let him run into the arms of your eternal merciful Father who loves you with an infinite love. And if we need proof, just look at the cross. He gave his only begotten Son, his, his most prized possession, to live and die for us. How much, what more do we need? What more do we need? Run to the arms of the Father. Run to the cross of Jesus. Glorify Jesus' passion by saying, Jesus, I am sorry. I need your mercy. May I have it. And he will grant it to you guaranteed. I promise you. And he will lift us, lift you and me, every time we do that, out of our misery. It's his mercy that lifts us out of all of our misery. Nothing else. Don't run to the world, the flesh, or the devil, or the enticements of sin. Do not do that. It only leads to more misery. It might be a temporary fix. It might be a temporary relief. 
that ultimately it leads to incredible unhappiness and misery. It leads to destruction. It is only the infinite mercy of God that heals all of the wounds caused by our sins, that lifts us out of that cesspool of sin. He will give us the grace that we won't even desire it anymore. I guarantee it. Take it from a person who knows, who has, who has lived like the prodigal son amongst the swine, lived a, a, a filthy lifestyle. I needed, the, desperately needed the mercy of God, and he lifted me right out of that the pit of the swine. I realized that I was on the road to self-destruction in my sinful life. I'm wasting all that God has given me, but he took me back. The pro- the, read the story of the prodigal son, the prodigal father, that Jesus said. That is the love of the father. He waits day and night, looks out his window, if you will, hoping that he will come back. That's it. That is the father. He doesn't condemn. He, he will say, rejoice, my son, my daughter was dead and now has come back to life has been lost and now is found. That's the mercy of God, and that's the message Jesus wants us to get out. So we'll do another show on that today. I think it is so very, very important in this fallen, broken world, this world that's full of such confusion, um, you know, with this pandemic and everything that's going on. We desperately, desperately need the mercy of God, and he's extending his hand over the whole world. It's there for the taking with open our eyes. Humble ourselves beneath the cross of Jesus and say, my merciful Savior, I am sorry for all my sins. Please forgive me, Jesus. Help me to love you with my whole being and grant me your infinite mercy through the Father's love. Guaranteed, you will get it. I guarantee it. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. And glory to your holy name. Thank you, Eternal Father, for giving us Jesus, your Son, a merciful Savior. If God so loved the world, he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. So St. John Paul II, St. Ant- uh, Saint, uh, Anthony Mary Claret, St. Uh, Alphonsus Liguori, St. Dominic, St. Louis de Montfort, St. Maximilian Colby, St. Pio, All these great saints, St. Anthony, St. Francis, St. Mother Teresa, St. Teresa the Little Flower, you name it. All these great saints had a deep, deep love for the Mother of God. Why? Well, Our Lady gives us an answer to that. It was I opened up to the message number 10 in the Marian Movement of Priests. The uh, interior locutions given to Father Goldie by the Great Mother of God herself. She tells him that no one has loved me more than my son Jesus. No one has loved the Mother of God and Jesus' mother more than Jesus himself. And if we want to truly imitate the great Son of God in all of his attributes and virtues and charity, his manner and everything that he is, so that we become pleasing to the Father, we need to imitate him in his great love for his mother. Can we say that we love the mother of Jesus more than himself, more than Jesus himself? And if Jesus so loves his mother, why do we reject her? Why would we do that? Why would Jesus want us to reject or ignore or push aside or say, I don't need her, or no, I go straight to Jesus? Why would he want that? I'm going to tell you a little story. Even my own mother, when she was sick in the nursing home, and she was sick at home, and I had a wonderful caretaker. Her name is Magdalia. What a great person, a great friend. I, um, she, I don't know if she took her faith as seriously as I have. I can't uh, speak for her. I don't, um, I, but what I will say is this woman 
took my mother to heart and loved my mother. And she took great care of her, and I, I watched. And it touched me so deeply that no matter what this woman has done in her past or her, her faith walk, whatever it is, I will never forget her. Never. Because of what she did for my mother. I pray for her every day. I send her thank you cards, thank you notes. I text her. Wish her a happy Mother's Day herself. Here's a woman that I never knew before but became a very big part of my family because the love she showed for my sick mother. If I could do that, a fallen, wretched, miserable creature... How much more than the Son of God made man? How much more would Jesus, our Savior, appreciate the love of a sinner who cares for his mother? Think about that, folks. You think about that long and hard. I guarantee you, you want to console the heart of Jesus? Console the heart of his mother. He will be so grateful and appreciative. I, I guarantee you the graces and blessings that he's going to hurl at you and lavish you with because you're wiping the tears of his mother, you're wiping the tears of Jesus. I don't know how to say this, but any man especially Jesus, including me. I'm a mama's boy. And if someone takes care of and and um, compliments and and um, respects my mother, I'm going to give back a hundredfold. I can't even imagine what Jesus would be as, as the son of God. But on the other hand, side of the coin, anyone who takes offense at my mother and hurls insults, it would be far better if that person hurled insults and punched me in the face. And I'm sure it's the same way with Jesus. I think it's easier for him to take offenses directed at him than offenses at his mother. I really do. And where am I, why do I think that? Well, it's my own personal experience, but I see it written in very many, in the mystics, the writings of the mystics. Jesus is writing his great love and, and, um, or his mother in Insinu Yezu, in the Divine Mercy. It's written everywhere, through the mouths of these saints and writings of these saints, on his sorrowful mother and what she endured for love of God and love of you and I. It is unimaginable. I'm hoping what St. John Paul wrote, and I'm going to read, is going to shed a little bit of light on the sacrifice that this great woman, Mary, has given not only for God, she sacrificed everything for love of God, but for love of neighbor, you and me, and Jesus raised her to the dignity of mother of God by in virtue of her fiat and raised her and gave us all of his, gave Mary all of his children redeemed by the Son to be their mother as well. What a great gift. What a great gift. Why? Why not? I mean, Jesus is a family. God is a family. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Relational family. Human beings need a mother and a father. We're not angelic. We are a family. A relational family. Mother, father, babies, children. Joseph, Mary, Jesus, mother, father, child. We're a family. God in his infinite mercy gave us the holy family to give us an incredible, awesome spiritual mother who mothered the Son of God herself. How could we say, oh, I don't need her? Oh, my goodness. What a lie from the devil. What a lie. Are we buying those lies? 
He gave us a spiritual father, St. Joseph. Jesus was the model for how we are to live as human beings. He had a family. He had a mother and a father. He looked up to them. Scripture tells us he was obedient to them, and he grew in age and wisdom and grace. Does that end when we on earth when Jesus left? No. No. Heaven starts here, Jesus says. The kingdom of heaven is within you. This is the beginning of eternal life on earth. And it will be that way in eternity. We will always have Mary as our spiritual mother and St. Joseph as our spiritual father, who in turn leads us ultimately to the Father in heaven. It will always be that way, whether we like it or not. So St. John Paul II, I ask you for your intercession and for your prayers to help us see what you saw. It is so beautiful what you wrote, St. John Paul II. I can't thank God enough. I hope what I read will inspire others to read more of what you write, your encyclicals, your apostolic letters on the mercy of God, on the mother of God, and everything that you wrote, fides et ratios. Faith in, in the reason and so many incredible encyclicals. What a great, great Pope, great saint. And um, I'm hoping everyone takes advantage of his great spirituality and writings and, and teachings. St. Joseph intercedes for us in a very powerful way as well. So, dear Immaculate Mother, we come in prayer and we beg your intercession as always to surround us all and protect us with your heavenly mantle of grace, with all the holy angels and saints and souls in purgatory, St. Michael, St. Gabriel, St. Raphael, our guardian angel, all you incredible angels. What a great gift you are to us. We can't thank God enough for you. We can't thank you enough for always being there as our friend, protection, help us to call upon you more and more, especially in these distressful times. We need your help, Holy Angels, and we embrace and accept your help with all our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, God. St. Joseph, intercede for us in a powerful way. St. Peel, St. Benedict, St. Dominic, St. Louis de Marfa, St. Maximilian Colby, St. Anthony Mary Clear, St. Alphonsus, St. Augustine, St. Teresa, St. Gemma, St. Faustina, St. Mother Teresa, and all you holy saints, Please intercede for us as we speak and talk and share our great love for Mary, our beautiful Queen Mother. Amen. So he titles it in his uh, St. John Paul II. Let me get the, the encyclical letter, Dives in Misericordia. And these are just excerpts. So, Dives in Misericordia. Cordia. Misericordia. All right. The mercy of God. He titles this number nine in that encyclical, Mother of Mercy, speaking of Mary, and he says, These words of the church at Easter re echo in the fullness of their prophetic content the words of Mary uttered during her visit to Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah. His mercy is from generation to generation. So that's the words of Our Lady expressing sharing and, and uh, crying out with great love her, her um, Magnificat. Hannah was the one, uh, the, the typology you can find of this in the Old Testament was the, was the canticle of Hannah, the canticle of Mary. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Why? He looked upon the humility of his handmaid, his servant, the servant of servants, Mary. He was mighty exalts. Why? Because of Mary's humility. God exalts equal and opposite to one's humility. And he humbles the proud but exalts the humble. You can't imagine the depth of Mary's humility and the heights at which God exalted her. You can't. But we need to take that into account. 
Mary is also the one who obtained mercy in a particular and exceptional way as no other person has. Yet, do we really know the depths of the love that Jesus had for his mother? And who are we to not follow in his footsteps? Who are we? Do we know better than God? At the same time, still in an exceptional way, she made possible with the sacrifice of her heart her own sharing in revealing God's mercy. This sacrifice is intimately linked with the cross of her son, at the foot of which she was to stand on Calvary. Do we know what Mary suffered? I really think we need to ask the Holy Spirit and ask Our Lady and ask Jesus to let us know. Because even Jesus says that she suffered equally in her heart. No, she's not God. But she, no other creature has participated more fully and more perfectly in the passion of Jesus than Mary. And if I may... Um, sidetrack just a little bit. I'm going to go to the Divine Mercy, what Jesus told St. Faustina. If you give me a minute here. Okay. Now, this is what Jesus told St. Faustina, who, by the way, like you and I, are sinners, who contracted the, the stain of original sin. I want to remind everyone that Mary has not. She possesses the fullness of original innocence. You and I deserve just punishment. And Jesus, our merciful Savior, took it upon himself. Mary did not. Yet she willfully, with her fiat, accepted and embraced all that she suffered as coming from the hand of God out of pure love for me and you, and pure love out of, for God. You and I, as sinners, deserve it. But God, in his infinite mercy, thanks be to God, wants us to accept his mercy. But no sin goes unpunished. No sin goes unpunished. We must make repent, and we must make uh, reparation for our sins. So this is what Jesus said to St. Faustina, a mere creature, fallen, wretched sinner like you and I who had to repent. This was the resurrection she was talking about. In Faustina's words, she says, Today, during the Mass of the Resurrection, I saw the Lord Jesus in the midst of a great light. He approached me and said, Peace be to you, my children. And he lifted up his hands and gave his blessing. The wounds in his hands, feet, and side were indelibly, indelible and shining. When he looked at me with such kindness and love, my whole soul drowned itself in him. And he said to me, You have taken a great part in my passion. Therefore, I now give you a great share in my joy and glory. I'm going to read that again. When he looked at me with such kindness and love, my whole soul drowned itself in him. And he said to me, this is St. Faustina, Jesus said to Faustina, you have taken a great part in my passion. Therefore, I now give you a great share in my joy and glory. Wow. A mere creature, a sinner like you and I, Jesus, because of what Faustina took part in his passion, by his grace, it's a great gift. It is an incredible gift that our Lord is calling us to share in his passion. I'm learning this. It's taken me a long time, too. But I'm starting to realize what an incredible gift it is by God, by Jesus, to say, come and partake in my sufferings. <sighs> oh, my goodness. Why? Therefore, I now give you a great share in my glory and my joy. St. Paul teaches 
he who participates in his suffering, don't you know that we are baptized into his death, but those that partake of his passion will shall also rise in glory with him? This is, this is our Lord. Now, the point I want to make is St. Faustina is partaking in a small portion, but Jesus is granting her incredible glory and joy. How much more the mother of God who participated fully without holding anything back, without any fear, without any being afforded any grace of the martyrs, without a complaint. Who are we? Who are we to say, I push this woman aside, I go straight to Jesus. Don't you know that this mother suffered for us too? Out of pure love for her son. And because her love for Jesus, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was pure, perfect, unimpeded. You can't get any greater love. She loved us with the, the same love she loved God. And it shows in her participation and willingness to share in her son's passion, life, death, his passion and resurrection. No other creature has participated it, in it more fully than Mary and no creature ever will. So it's food for thought. We need to say, I love you, Mary, because Jesus loves you that much. And I surrender as, as a per the request of your son who gave you to me at the foot of the cross. Woman, behold your son. John represents the whole church, the whole human race. We need to get that. I accept you as my queen and more tenderly my mother because you raised Jesus. You raised Jesus. And I want to become just like him. If God the Father entrusted the care of his son in in your care, how much more do I need you, Mother, Mother Mary, Mother of Jesus, so that you could mother me, form me, mold me, care for me, nurture me, and obtain for me all those graces that make me into a perfect copy of the perfect son, Jesus. That's what I want. That's my prayer for all those that are listening, to become just like Jesus, pleasing to the Father. I wouldn't have it any other way. What an incredible gift. Glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So be it. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, my goodness. I want to be just like Jesus. And I'm hoping you you do too. And I want to love Mary the way Jesus loves Mary. I want to love your mother, Jesus, the way you do. So that she can make me love you the way she loves you. That's what it's all about. There's nothing more than I want in this world. Nothing. And I'm hoping that you all are inspired by uh, these words and these prayers. So Mary is the one who obtained mercy in a particular and exceptional way as no other person has. At the same time, still in an exceptional way, she made possible with the sacrifice of her heart her own sharing in revealing God's mercy This sacrifice is intimately linked with the cross of her son at the foot of which she was to stand on Calvary. Her sacrifice is a unique sharing in the revelation of mercy. That is, a sharing in the absolute fidelity of God to his own love, to the covenant that he willed from eternity. God willed this from eternity. Who are we? to say we know better than God. Who are we? 
and that he entered into in time with man, with the people, with humanity, it is a sharing in that revelation that was definitively fulfilled through the cross. No one has received into his heart as much as Mary did. These are words of a great saint who knew it, whose father pointed to a statue and said, there is your mother now. St. John Paul II, as a young Carol who lost his mother, I guarantee you, he took Mary deeply into his heart. And when he found St. Louis de Montfort, he took her even deeper because of his consecration. Because St. Louis says, there is no more powerful, more, more quicker, more beautiful, more powerful way to sanctification than to marrying consecration. And St. John Paul II took that to heart. That's why he's called the great. No one has received into his heart as much as Mary did that mystery, that truly divine, divine dimension of the redemption affected on Calvary by means of the death of the Son, together with the sacrifice of her maternal heart, together with her definitive fiat. We forget about that. Mary gave her fiat. What does that mean? When the archangel Gabriel came during the Annunciation, he said, fear not, Mary. And Mary said, well, what kind of visitation is this? This was strange to her. It's not that she hasn't been accustomed to seeing angels, but this visitation was different. Fear not, the archangel Gabriel says, for you are to become the, the mother of the Savior. Well, how can this be, Mary said. Did she doubt? No. She just didn't understand. How can it be since I do not know man? And the archangel Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. The typology of the overshadowing is in the Old Testament when the cloud of God overshadowed the ark. In Moses' days, in David's days, follow the ark Wherever he went, he always overshadows the ark. He always overshadows the ark of the new covenant, Mary, and he always will. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and you will conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what did Mary say? Let it be done to me according to your word. Now, can you imagine if Mary said to the archangel Gabriel, you know, Gabriel, I don't speak to angels. I don't go, I go directly to God. I really, you know, if you can keep it that way, I'm very uncomfortable with that. You know, I, I don't really need you because I want to give God all the glory. I don't want to give you any glory, Archangel Gabriel, because I go directly to God. Can you imagine if Mary did that? The queen of the angels. Here's the queen of the angels who is higher than the angels by virtue of her immaculate conception. Says, be it done unto me according to your word, Gabriel. Because she knows in her humility that what's coming out of the mouth of the angel Gabriel is God's word. We should also humble ourselves like Mary and know that whatever comes out of the mouth of the great mother of God is the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because God wants it that way. That's it. Whether we like it or not. No one has received into his heart as much as Mary did. Mary received Jesus more than any other creature into her heart. Who are we to say otherwise? That mystery, that truly divine dimension of redemption affected on Calvary by means of the death of the Son, together with the sacrifice of her maternal heart, together with her definitive fiat, be it done unto me according to your word. Mary is a free creature who exercised her freedom 
It wasn't determined by God, folks. I don't care what you think. She said yes. Well, Adam and Eve said no. Mary said yes, gave her fiat to the holy God, the one true God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through the mouth of an angel, the word of God. He said yes to God, where Adam and Eve said no to the triune God, and yes to the serpent. They gave their fiat to Satan. Mary undid this sin by giving her fiat to God. Who are we? Who are we? To say that she is just an insignificant creature that God no longer needs. Who are we to say that? Mary, then, is the one who has the deepest knowledge of the mystery of God's mercy. That's why she has the title of Mother of Mercy. She obtains mercy for us. Why would we not want that? Jesus never refuses his mother's request. The typology of that is in the book of Samuel. He made his mother queen and honored her every request. Jesus made his mother queen and honors her every request. Who are we to say we know better? She knows its price. She knows how great it is. In this sense, we call her the Mother of Mercy, Our Lady of Mercy, or Mother of Divine Mercy. Of course, God is merciful love itself. When she became Mother of God, she also becomes Mother of Mercy. The divine attributes are one. His beauty, his goodness, God is truth, God is mercy, God is love. God is one. God is infinite. God is almighty. Mary became mother of all this. Why? Because Jesus is the God man. And St. Paul, John Paul will explain it a little bit later. In this sense, we call her Mother of Mercy, Lady of Mercy, our Mother of Divine Mercy. In each one of these titles, there is a deep theological meaning, for they express the special participation of her soul, of her whole personality, so that she was able to perceive through this complex event, first of Israel, then of every individual, and of the whole humanity, that mercy of which from generation to generation, all generations will call me blessed. It doesn't say except for these or except for those who refuse to accept her. Unless if you choose that, choose to believe the lie of Satan, every generation will call me blessed. People become sharers according to the eternal design of the Most Holy Trinity. The above titles which we actually attribute to the Mother of God speak of her principally, however, as the Mother of the Crucified and Risen One, as the One who, having obtained mercy in an exceptional way, in an equally exceptional way, merits that mercy throughout her earthly life and particularly at the foot of the cross of her son, and finally as the one who through her hidden and at the same time incomparable sharing in the messianic mission of her son was called in a special way to bring close to people that love which he had come to reveal, the love that finds its most concrete expression vis-a-vis, the suffering, the poor, those deprived of their own freedom, the blind, the oppressed, and sinners, just as Christ spoke of them in the words of the prophet Isaiah. It was precisely this merciful love which is manifested above all in contact with moral and physical evil, that the heart of her, meaning Mary, who was the mother of the crucified and risen one, shared in 
singularly and exceptionally that Mary shared him. In her and through her, this love continues to be revealed in the history of the church and of humanity. This revelation is especially fruitful because in the mother of God, it is based upon the unique tact of her maternal heart. On her particular sensitivity, on her particular fitness, to reach all those who most easily accept the merciful love of a mother. This is one of the great life-giving mysteries of Christianity, a mystery intimately connected with the mystery of the Incarnation, the motherhood of Mary in the order of grace. The Second Vatican Council explains, last without interruption. All right, so this is important, the motherhood of Mary in the order of grace last without interruption, meaning she's still our mother. She's still our mother. And I would have to say that, like the words, I, I want to repeat the words of Louisa Picaretta, where she said, if it wasn't for the infinite mercy of God and my heavenly mother, I would be lost. And that goes true for me. Because in my deepest, darkest hours, my, the times that I literally had one foot in hell and the other one on a banana peel, it could have slipped in very easily. Where my life was just so, I was in such despair. I desperately needed help. It was always the mother of mercy. Our Lady of Sorrows, the Mother of Jesus, who has come to my rescue with her sweetness, with her great prayer and, and influence over her son, that she was able to obtain the mercy for me. And she obtains mercy for all of us. It is through Mary's mediation that Jesus grants us his mercy. Whether we know it or not, believe it or not, accept it or not, or like it or not, She's always our mother, whether we accept her as a mother or not. She is our mother. Mothers never, ever reject their children. Never. Even if in the misfortune of her children rejecting her. She doesn't want that. And she's always there. She doesn't stop loving us as her children. Because God gave us to her as her children. Whether we like it or not, believe it or not, accept it or not, care about it or not, we're the children of Mary. Because Jesus is our big brother, the firstborn of many children. Many brethren. In her and through her, this love continues to be revealed. Now, this is St. John Paul II again. In the history of the church and of humanity, this revelation is especially fruitful because in the mother of God, it is based upon the unique tact of her maternal heart, on her particular sensitivity, on her particular fitness. Mary is fit for this job. Why? Because God made it that way. Not you and me, not the church, not any pope, not any Catholic. God made it perfect for this job. It was by his grace of anticipation that he preserved Mary from the effects of original sin who made it possible in her fiat to conceive the Son of God, the incarnation, the incarnate word, the word became flesh among us and dwelt among us without Mary being fit for that in virtue of her the great grace, a singular privilege of the Immaculate Conception, we would not have the Savior. It is all God's grace, that's for sure. But in God's grace, he in his infinite wisdom made Mary fit for this job. To reach all those who most easily accept the merciful love of of a mother. How could anyone refuse the merciful love of a mother? Of course not. God knows that. We need a mother. We need the tender love of a mother. We need a motherly 
mother's touch and caress and sweetness. She's the one that pours all the balm on our wounds, both physical and spiritual. I need my mom. We need our mother. God knows this. God the Father knows that. This is the one of the great life-giving mysteries of Christianity, a mystery intimately connected with the mystery of the incarnation. This is big stuff. St. John Paul II explains this so beautifully in virtue of the hypostatic union of the God-man. God is one. He's two natures, but he's one. He's both God and man. It's not that he has separate natures, two natures, you know. Or two persons, I should say. He's one. He's got two natures. He's divine and human. But he's one person. The hypostatic union. It's a mystery. I don't understand it. But the, the hypostatic union was conceived in the womb of Mary. The hypostatic union happened in the womb of Mary. Whoa! Think about that, folks. What did that do to the being of Mary? Oh, my goodness. Stuff to meditate on. I don't understand it, but what I do know, it sends my soul, my soul and my heart soaring, even though I don't understand it. These are incredible mysteries that are beyond our comprehension. I just have to accept it in humility until God brings us to the fitness of understanding it. The motherhood of Mary in the order of grace um, lasts without interruption. All right, that's the Second Vatican Council. And which she sustained without hesitation under the cross. All right? So, the motherhood of Mary lasts without interruption from the consent which she faithfully gave at the Annunciation, fiat, be it done unto me according to your word. And Mary gave her fiat to God, but we don't, we got to look a little deeper. Is God giving her fiat to Mary because of Mary's fiat? You know what, I, I want to stop here because this, and I, I think I need to... Um, uh, clarify or or uh, give a little bit of an explanation of what's going on here um, with with a person who has been immaculately conceived. What that means is she possesses the fullness of original sin, which Adam and Eve enjoyed before the fall. After the fall, Adam and Eve they hid themselves, and God said, "Where are you? I'm here." Adam said, I am hiding in the garden. Why are you hiding? Well, I'm ashamed. I'm afraid. Who told you you were ashamed? You were naked, God said. Therefore, you must have sinned. That's why he felt shame and afraid and naked. He was running and hiding from God. He no longer was completely and totally open to the reception of the great gift of God, the Holy Spirit. There was a barrier there now. There was hesitation. There was fear. That's why the archangel Gabriel said to Mary, fear not, because in fear there is doubt, and you could block what God wants to accomplish in you. Now, it's not that Mary would have doubted, but she didn't understand. And the spousal relationship between Adam and Eve prior to the fall was totally open. They held nothing back from each other. They held nothing back. It was a free gift of total self one to the other without holding anything back. Adam gave himself totally, spiritually, physically, emotionally, everything that he ha was and had and is, his whole being he gave to his spouse Eve. And Eve in turn did the same thing to her spouse Adam. They didn't hold anything back. There was no fear there. There was no hesitation. And each one as they gave themselves, they both equally were open to receive the gift without fear or hesitation. 
That's why the Immaculate Conception was so important to receive the fullness of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the incarnate word. Otherwise, it would not have taken place. Mary said yes. The way Adam and Eve would have said yes to one another prior to the fall. If Mary were conceived in sin, this would never, ever have taken place. What a great grace by our God. Thank you, God, for this incredible grace of the Immaculate Conception so that she could be totally open without any hesitation to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, and you shall conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in that way, by Mary's fiat, in God's fiat, in this spousal relationship, it is a spousal relationship Relationship between God and creature. Where do we find that elsewhere in Scripture? A spousal relationship in the deepest sense, both spiritually and physically. Nowhere. We find a mystical spousal relationship as the mystical body of Christ, the bride of Christ, but not like this singular privilege of this great mother of God ever will that ever have she's the only one and in that beautiful spousal love between god and mary creature was conceived the god man wow the hypostatic union took place holy moly think about that saint john paul ii writes on all of this i learned this from him and in prayer, and I'm able, and through what he wrote in prayer, I'm able to put it together. And that's where it makes sense. St. Joseph is another story. The same thing. He was Mary's spouse. That's another show. We'll get to him a little bit down the road um, where they enjoyed that spousal love between Mary and Joseph as it was prior to the fall of Adam and Eve. You've got two perfect spouses here. You and I, or spouses under the effects of original sin, we don't understand this. I, we don't understand what it means to be a total selfless donation of one to the other. That's why Jesus gives us marriage as a sacrament. We need the grace, the sacramental grace of the sacrament of matrimony and the sacraments. We need that grace so that we could have the strength to live that pure spousal relationship, but it falls short regardless. You know, we have a tendency to use one another as an object of manipulation, whether we believe it or not, or we realize it or not, or we want to do that or not, it happens. So in that sense, we're holding something back. And when we use contraception in, in a relationship, a marriage relationship, we're holding back. It's, it's out of order with the way God wanted it to be. That is showing some sort of selfishness. God, the love between the Father and the Son and the love between Mary and the Holy Spirit was pure and selfless, total selfless donation. It's hard for us to understand as fallen creatures. We need the grace of God. We need the sacraments. We need the help of these two beautiful spiritual parents of ours, Mary and Joseph, and we need the Christ child right there in the middle of the Holy Family who is the source of grace for all of this. We need the Holy Family, one, mo one mother, one father, and the Jesus in the center of each family, Christ in the center. In fact, being assumed into heaven, now this is going back to St. John Paul too. she has not laid aside this office of salvation. And Mary is still our mother. And even after being assumed, now we have to remember, what does that mean, assumed? Mary was assumed both body and soul. The rest of us have to wait to the end of time for our bodies to rise with Christ to be resurrected, 
you can see it written and prophesied in the book of Job. Um, Jesus talks about it uh, in his uh, last uh, in his the bread of life discourse. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I abide in him, and he in me, and I will raise him on the last day. By her maternal charity, well, let me back up here. In fact, being assumed into heaven, she has not laid aside this office of salvation. But by her manifold intercession, she continues to obtain for us the graces of eternal salvation. That's so important. She continues to obtain for us the graces of eternal salvation. St. John Paul II and many other great saints, especially the Marian saints, call Mary mediatrix of all graces. Because that is what she is. All graces came through her mediation as being when she gave her fiat, the source of all grace, the incarnate word, the hypostatic union, the word made flesh who dwells among us. She was the mediator for that to happen. It's amazing. She continues to be the mediator. You know, here's another thing that I just learned. Scientists and doctors, and this is very interesting, have discovered that even after birth, there are very special cells from the baby that remain in the mother. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? The baby cells, very special cells, remain even after birth. They will always be with the mother. In that sense, the mother and child are always one in flesh. If that's true for us uh, ordinary creatures, then it must be true for the mother of God, folks. The very cells of the incarnate word before he even died and rose and ascended into heaven are still in the body of Mary. They may be in a glorified state along with Jesus' glorified body because Mary's body is glorified. I don't know. But what I do know is if that's true, they must still be there. Mary is still Eucharistic. Mary is the pure Eucharist, purely Eucharistic, like the Ark and the Ark of the Old Covenant where the Word of God was contained, the Word of God and the manna which represents the Eucharist, the bread of life that every priest brings it down upon the altar by the words of the priest. A substantial change of the bread and wine has now become the substantial presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, the way he was 2,000 years ago. It is truly Jesus of Nazareth in the Eucharist. Truly Jesus of Nazareth that remains in the body of his mother, his flesh, his cells. My goodness. Not only is she Eucharistic physically, she is Eucharistic spiritually in her total being. Spouse of the Holy Ghost. No one is more one with God as a creature can possibly be than Mary. No one. And no one ever will be. By her maternal charity, she takes care of the brethren of her son. Now, who's that? By her maternal charity, she takes care of the brethren of her son. St. John Hughes and many other saints say, we cannot say that we are brothers of Jesus if we reject the mother of Jesus. Those are my words. Those are words of great saints. But it makes sense. Anybody who receives Mary, the mother of Jesus, as their mother, has a right to say that Jesus is my brother. And after all, Jesus gave us his mother from the cross. Woman, behold your son and your daughter. But John represents all of us. And I say, Jesus, I embrace this great gift of your mother with my whole being. I love you, Jesus. And to show that I love you, I accept Mary 
into my heart as my spiritual mother. And I give her all that I am and have so that she can make me into that great saint that you want me to become. That she can make me into another perfect image and copy of you, Jesus. Because I love you, Jesus. And there's no one I want to be like more than you. The church seems in a particular way to profess the mercy of God and to venerate it when she directs herself. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. By her maternal charity, she takes care of the brethren of her son, you and I, who still journey on earth, surrounded by dangers and difficulties until they are led into their blessed home. Wow, this is so deep. And um, I want to share another story with you, and I think we'll, uh, we'll close it out um, for today. And we'll pick this up another because this is so rich. Um, this story happened to me how our mother Mary is, is such a protector and anyone who is a child of Mary and if anybody messes with a child of Mary, woe to that one. I'm really, I'm not kidding. And I mean, nobody messes with Mary's children. Why do I say that? Well, I'm going to give you, I had a, a dream. One day, this was maybe, I don't know, about 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I was just starting my faith. I was a neophyte, if you will. I didn't understand. I didn't know. It was all new to me, and I was frightened. And um, I was uh, getting these demonic dreams, and... um, it was. It was. I knew. I knew it was uh, demonic, and, and it was. They were harassing me. The dreams. They were harassing, and um, you know. I don't want to go into detail on that, but nevertheless, I knew it was demonic. So I was frightened, and I and I woke up and I started praying with all my heart. Please, Mother Mary, protect me, dear Mother. All. Oh, I'm so frightened. I don't know what the devil's doing, and I'm scared. Blessed Mother, will you please help me? I'm saying my hail Marys with all my heart. And finally, I fell back to sleep. And I had another dream. And my dream started out with, it was kind of bizarre, where I was walking down a road and this black figure, like a, I don't know, kind of like a bank robber, he was a criminal, and he comes up and he points the gun, he puts, pulls the gun and puts it right on my head. And he's just about to fire to kill me. And all of a sudden I got snatched straight out of his presence and snatch right up into the sky like somebody like a rubber band shot me up into the sky i don't know how else to describe that and i found myself way up in the sky in this one room house but it had no floor it was like uh the best i could describe was uh like the wizard of oz the house when it got taken up by the tornado and was spinning around kind of like that believe it or not But I was in this one-room house, and I was sitting near the ceiling in shorts. And in this house, I felt so secure. I didn't fall through the floor. I felt so safe, so secure, such peace. But this gentle wind was blowing around in the house. A beautiful, gentle wind was blowing through our ears and swirling around the house. And sitting below me was a priest. He was a very good friend of mine, Father Vito. And below him was another priest, Father Papa. And I looked down at Father Vito. I said, hey, Father Vito, what's God the Father doing? This is great, the wind. And he looks up to me. He says, I don't know, Bobby. (laughs) He didn't know. Anyways, it was so powerful, but I felt so safe and so secure that nothing can harm me. And all of a sudden, I felt as if I just, as fast as I got slingshotted up into the sky, I descended back into my bed, and I actually bounced in my bed. It was weird. And I woke up. I'm like, what was that? But in my heart and mind, I envisioned Mary as being a mama bear. And she was with her cubs. 
And along came a wolf and wanted to eat one of them cubs. And I want you to imagine what this mama bear, Mary, did to that wolf. Believe you me, there was not a shred left. This is the protection that the mother of God gives to one of her children. Just as a mother bear would rip the shreds out of a predator, out of an enemy who wants to snatch away and attack and devour her child, this mother of God against an enemy is merciless. I guarantee you, she is the mother of mercy. She is merciful beyond imagining to her children. But to the enemy who wants to devour her children, look out, woe to you. So that's my story. And I hope that you take it to heart and take and um, really, really take Mary to heart and embrace her as your mother as a great gift from the Father, from the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mary is the most tender, merciful, sweetest mother you can imagine. You will melt beyond imagining at the presence of Mary, the sound of her voice. You will feel her constant consolation. And if you don't immediately go to her, Mother, I need you. She will immediately come, I guarantee you. Guaranteed. What more can I say? I'm a, per, I'm a witness to this. I'm giving you my own testimony. And I love Mary so much for this, I want to share and I can't contain it. I'm like Jesus in the temple. Did you not know I must be about my father's business? Well, did you not know I must be about my mother's business? <laughs> That's right. And I will continue, and I will not stop, because I love my mother Mary. I love the mother of Jesus. And I can't thank God enough for this great, great gift. Thank you, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what I would do without her. I'm hoping this inspires all of you. I hope that you're listening, and uh, we'll tune in next time. And uh, we'll continue with this because this is so powerful. And, uh, you know, like St. Louis de Montfort says, we must make Mary known so that she can make Jesus known and loved. That's what it's all about. And Jesus at Fatima, he was at Fatima. He said, I desire that all God's children be consecrated to the immaculate heart of my mother so that she could bring them to perfect consecration to my sacred heart. That's what it's all about. That's what she does best. She doesn't want to do anything other than that. Her greatest joy is to use all that God made her be to bring us to that perfect consecration of her son. That's it. And no other creature does it better. No other creature glorifies God more. No other creature satiates, satiates the thirst for souls. When Jesus said, I thirst, Mary is the, the no other creature does, satisfies that thirst for souls for her son more than Mary. No one. So there you have it, folks. So we begin or end with a prayer. And we're going to ask this great queen, this great mother of God, to touch all the hearts listening. Inspire them, dear mother. Show them how much you love them. And let them know that you are always, always there to bring them to Jesus, to bring, to be, uh, to obtain for all of your children that mercy, that wonderful mercy that Jesus won for us, dying on the cross by his life, death, and resurrection. This is what God wants, his mercy, his, his mercy that removes all of our misery caused by our sins. It is his mercy that heals us of our sins. It is his mercy that raises us up to the dignity of sons and daughters of God. It is God's mercy that strengthens us against the wiles and attacks of the devil. It is God's mercy that makes us strong in the spiritual walk in this dangerous world. It is God's mercy that transforms us into other Christ. We ask you to, to be with us, dear Mother, always, and protect us and our families under your heavenly mantle of grace. In the union of St. Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good night, everyone, and see you next time. God bless.
WCATradio.com has a show for every interest. Apologetics, theology, moral living, and more. Know Your Faith. Please look up my show, Know Your Faith, by logging into WCATradio.com. Then click on Fridays, and that's where you'll find me. Know Your Faith, a show hosted by me, Robert Madrigal, and we'll see you at the show. For listening to a production of WCAT Radio, please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up when knowledge takes flight.